is going to play the music. We're going to start out by singing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. That's a precious song, and I'm teaching him his old numbers. I don't want him to get so modernized when he begins in these old songs. Man, so much. What took me so long? Well, I, I think it was a few things. Um, one was, you know, I, I got my start in gospel music as a songwriter. Uh, that was my entrance into music. Of course, uh, my father, the history of him in, in gospel music. But I realized pretty early on that as an artist, um, it was gonna limit me. I mean, just by the very nature uh, of the genre, it was gonna limit uh, what I was able to talk about. Gospel music is usually focused on God. I wanted to talk about love. I wanted to talk about life. And um, I knew that I would be limited in, in gospel. No, oh, he's a preacher's kid who's gone on to write Grammy award winning music. But that's not the only thing PJ Morton is writing these days. He's written a new book and the debate behind it is the focus of this week's Faces of Faith. Why can I talk about love? Grammy-winning songwriter and producer P.J. Morton has written and produced songs for top artists such as India R.E., Music Soul Child, and Men of Standard. Now he's written a book called Why Can't I Sing About Love? Some churchgoers believe you can't sing at R&B on Saturday and praise God on Sunday. And also I knew there were people like me who, uh, you know, I feel like a whole audience was going um, unserved. Uh, people who wanted to hear about life and wanted to hear about love, but still were people of faith um, and, and, and their faith meant a lot to them and they didn't want to compromise who they were. The pressure to sing gospel was even greater for PJ because he's the son of not one, but two mega preachers. Together, PJ's father, Bishop Paul S. Morton, and his mother, Deborah Morton, pastor a congregation that stretches from Atlanta to New Orleans. Um, as a kid, I, gospel music was um, what was uh, closest to me. And um, growing up as a pastor's kid, um, you kind of got the idea that it was wrong to do anything else outside of that. At age 14, with tears in his eyes, PJ finally approached his father. It was a shock at first because this is my only son. I only have one son. And so I just thought that he would follow in my footsteps. But then I, I began to realize, hey, everybody has to do what they are called to do. A gospel artist himself, Bishop Morton, believes that there is a place in the church for love songs. When you are with uh, your spouse, uh, you just, just some songs you don't want to hear. I mean, I, I love Amazing Grace, but when I'm with my wife, it's not Amazing Grace. Come on, give me a love song. Let's be for real. So that became my mission uh, as an artist was to create music uh, that anybody from five to uh, 105 could feel comfortable listening to. Um, but it was still jamming, it was still good music and it wasn't watered down, it wasn't corny. Um, so uh, for these many years of my career, uh, that has been my purpose. Um, and I felt like people had the gospel genre and had that message taken care of. And so I was to play my part and that's what I've been doing. Hey dad, how you doing? Fine, you doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. Good, good. Uh, so, you know, I'm finally doing a gospel album. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, a, d a day that we didn't know would ever come, but uh, yes. you always told me that you, you prayed over my hands. I, I didn't, uh, unfortunately can't read music, but, but got the gift, you know, and, and just started to play. And a lot of the songs that I wrote was right there on the organ. Uh, no offense, sometimes when you were giving announcements or talking, I was on the organ and I was writing well, let's, let's be honest, let's be honest. <laughs> sometimes when I was preaching, and that's what you, you was writing. No, you're supposed to. I, I think you're right. To the to the you're right. You're right there. You're right. Uh, but it worked out. It worked out. And now yeah, we're here. Uh, and now here's the gospel according to PJ, to PJ, to PJ. So why a gospel album now? Well, um, 
you know, I've written many, many songs and produced many songs over the years. Um, but you, you start to learn that uh, when, you, when you write and produce a song, uh, sometimes that's the end of it for you. Uh, you hand it over and the artist and the label, uh, they, they do what they do with it and you don't have any control over how it's, how it's brought out and how it's uh, presented. Also, uh, you know, what better time than now when, when it seems like it's the darkest in our world to, uh, to, to send out that message I think the world needed some more light, needed some more inspiration. And I don't think any genre of music does inspiration and light and hope better than gospel music. So um, it, it was time and, um, and, it, and it all started to come together. Uh, I was working on uh, Leandria Lee Johnson's album and uh, I wrote some songs for her and um, they, they decided to go a different direction with the album. And I love these songs. Like I love these songs that, that we worked on. And I was like, man, I, I've got to get these songs out somehow. If they're not going to use them, I'm going to take them and use them. And, and that was the seed that was planted for this, for this idea for Gospel According to PJ. Uh, and one of those songs uh, was all in his plan. Uh, I wrote it for Leandria uh, with her in mind. And um, once we started to get into it, and I realized that I wanted to do a, a collaborative project. Uh, I thought about, because uh, I'm such a big fan of Leandria, I, I was actually the co-music director uh, when she won Sunday Best. Uh, so I, I, I literally watched her from the beginning to now, and she's one of my favorites. But I said, what would make this, what would make this extra special? And um, it was Essence Fest in New Orleans, and Mary Mary just happened to be here. They're great friends of mine. Uh, and uh, I just begged them to come to the studio. They had a long day at Essence Fest, and I'm like, can you just come to the studio and, and do this song for me? Somebody help my brain. After this long day, you know what I said yes to? Wake up! Going to the studio. Wake up! But we're working with PJ, so. Twenty-four hours, almost gone. Get up. Uh, what? Don't get there. Get up. It don't get there. Clocks don't stop it. Time won't wait. Get up. Guess I'm coming with PJ Morton. I hope I have voice left. I don't know. After Essence, some my guts up. And uh, they obliged. And um, it was special because they hadn't been in the studio in a long time. They hadn't recorded together in a long time. And so I knew it was a long shot. But they ended up coming to the studio and knocking that out for me. And, um, and, and, and the All In This Plan that you know of today was born. And uh, it became my first number one, my first number one radio single. And uh, it's very special to me. The process for the album was really uh, getting the songs first. Uh, before I thought of any artists on the album, I thought about what songs I wanted to tell this story because a uh, gospel according to PJ, what did, what, what did that really mean? And I wanted to show my journey through gospel music, um, which is uh, something I never left. You know, uh, I think I wanted to show that as well, uh, that, you know, although I was uh, putting out my R&B albums and, 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 you know, uh, with Maroon 5, I never really left gospel music. I was always writing songs for artists and producing songs for artists. So I wanted to show that journey because some people know uh, some of the songs I've written and some people aren't familiar with some of the songs that I've written. So I wanted to show that. And then I wanted to make sure that I got the right artist to sing those songs. So that was the process. We had all in this plan already. Uh, and another song I knew that had to be a part of the, the album was Let Go. Uh, Let Go, who I originally wrote for Dwayne Woods. I was doing a conference in Orlando and uh, he and his dad were actually ministering there at the conference and I told him, I said, man, I'm, I'm like a huge fan of yours and I, I believe one day I'm going to be able to work with you, you know, and I believe, I'm sure he was probably like, you know, hey, yeah, cool, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out, you know, doing that old jive talk, but I was dead serious about it. Uh, Dwayne uh, was a special artist, but this song almost didn't happen. Uh, I, I originally wrote Let Go for Men of Standard. Those were the guys that gave me my start. Uh, so I usually 
It was thinking of them when I was writing. I wrote Let Go for them. They were almost done with their album, uh, or just had finished the album, and didn't have any space for the song. They would have had to take a song off the album to put this one on, and uh, they didn't want to do that. They were happy with their album. I understood that. Uh, so I moved on. I remember Dave Hollister was working on his first gospel album. And um, I told him, I said, I got this song called Let Go. Uh, Dave loved the song, but I don't think the label really believed in the song. Oh, you know what? I think what, one other little story, because I, I don't know if you remember this, but when I wrote Let Go, Let God, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I, I wrote it for Men of Standard first, right? right and Men right. of Standard was done with their album. But the second person I tried to give that song to was you, because you were doing your first gospel album. And I think you were finishing at the same time. But I always tell people that that song went the way it was supposed to, like with it the right story it and with his, his, his testimony. That was supposed to be his record. Uh, yeah. But that yeah. is a fun fact that it could have been Dave Hollister singing Let Go. I was, man, I was going to bring that up, but I said no. But now that you mentioned it, yeah, man. We, had, we had an executive and I was like, this is it. Y'all talking about y'all want to hit? This is it. And she yeah. said, nah, this ain't no hit. So we passed there. So two times, I'm like, man, it's uh, I'll, I'll just give up on this song. Or I'll just leave it there. And Dwayne's manager called me. And, and said, can you meet with Dwayne? I had an opportunity to have a, a chance meeting with him and uh, walked into the studio <clears throat> and sitting down with him, he was, you know, just kind of asking me about my story, just asking me about my life. And I shared with him uh, my testimony of healing and just all of the things that I had to go through even to get to that point. And literally while he was talking to me, I was hearing the, the words of my song in my head, because it was exactly what he was talking about. And then he was like, you know, I have a song that, that's really perfect, that would really fit this. You know, it's, it's been uh, pitched to a couple of different artists, but nobody has picked it up. And uh, the minute he played Let Go, I heard the very first line, I couldn't seem to fall asleep. There was so much on my mind. And immediately I started crying. And uh, I, I told him right then and there, this song was meant for you. It's almost like I wrote it for you, even though I didn't know who you were. Never did we have uh, any clue that, you know, a couple of years later, there we are on the Stella Award stage. There we are uh, with, with five nominations, walking away with, with basically four of the five nominations. Uh, PJ walking away with, with Song of the Year. Soon as Dwayne did it, we was all at the Stella Awards the next year, and I Thank sat up and right. Dwayne went, he won all the awards, and I looked over I there. I won Song of the Year. Yeah. Exactly, and I looked over there at her like, uh, <laughs> you know what a word I said. Uh, well, it was all meant to. It was all yes, meant to be. Because that's what made my boy. Yeah, like, no okay. doubt, no doubt. You know, you really don't know how a song will really take off. Um, I did not know. I did. I mean, we're 15 years into this song, and I just, I just recently said a couple of weeks ago that it's, it's just interesting that I literally have to jog my memory um to be able to kind of think back 15 years of just how this song has been uh such an impact it's been timeless uh, it's just that message of letting go and letting god have his way you never really know how one meeting can change your destiny like i said got me my first song of the year award at the stellars and really started my career it really it really pushed me forward and that's how I felt it was in meeting P.J. Morton. I believe that he really set my voice in the industry. I think that when people automatically hear me, they automatically think P.J. Morton in their head just because that's the sound that he's created for me. And I'm forever, forever grateful. And I speak that not just as him being my producer, but I speak it also as a fan. Um, P.J. Morton, you are the absolute greatest. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for just impacting my life. Thank you for the music that you've written for me. Thank you for the songs, Never Be the Same. Thank you for the messages of, of Lost. And thank you for the messages of, of Let Go and, and all of this because I just believe that your music is consistently timeless and it is consistently the message that we all need to hear in this day and time. And uh, so I knew that that had to be a part of the project. I thought about, uh, putting it with a song that was not as well known that I wrote for Dwayne Woods called God Can. Uh, it just happens to be one of my favorite songs that, I, that I'd written for someone. So I thought about uh, putting those songs together and it was really like, you know, God Can talk, talks about knowing that God can 
And then let go talks about letting go so God can do his thing. And I just thought that was a cool thing. And I thought of Smokey Norfolk, one of my favorites. I remember the first time I ever saw him play and sing, uh, and it was a game changer. Uh, and I heard Smokey's voice clear on this song, called him. I flew out to Chicago and uh, we recorded it and uh, it just it just came out amazing. So after we recorded the song with Smokey, um, I had to go on tour. Uh, so we had to pause on the album. And the plan was after tour, um, I was going to get back in the studio and record with all the other artists. Uh, but then something happened that none of us could have predicted. We turned to Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He is on the front lines here in the U.S. response to the coronavirus outbreak. You think about it, the coronavirus crisis is changing so fast uh, that these maps can't keep up. The great shutdown of 2020 is underway. Um, COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus uh, hit the world uh, while I was on tour and everything shut down. Uh, and I thought that man, um, you know, cause part of the excitement for me with this album was being in the studio with all these amazing artists, getting to produce them the way I heard it and taking away that element uh, just, just made me feel like uh, that's not exactly how I wanted to do it. But then I started thinking of the bigger picture and that was um, these messages, these songs, these words, these lyrics, are meant to be out in the world and uh, what better time than now. So I started to push through and I started to think of artists that I knew uh, could handle recording themselves uh, with me just giving a guide. And I thought about Repay You. Repay You was a song that I wrote originally for Chanel from Trinity 5-7. That's my New Orleans home girl. And um, she sang it so beautifully the first time. And I, you know, not as many people as I wanted to hear that song, heard that song, but it was almost like I wrote it for this time. Uh, the first line is, uh, I have so many friends who are no longer here. And so many of us were experience, experiencing that uh, with, with, uh, with the pandemic going on. And Jay Moss, uh, produced the very first song that I ever placed. So this was full circle for me. And that voice, that unique voice, uh, hadn't been heard in a while and uh, I wanted to hear it. So I reached out to Jay and um, he did what Jay Moss does and uh, just killed it. And uh, the rest was history. Once he did that, to be honest, it gave me the energy I needed to want to finish this album and really get into it. He showed me that, man, this, this vision that I have for it, it's on point. Let's keep going. Let's not, let's not halt it. So then we started to rethink this whole thing and figure out how we were going to do it virtually uh, from, from where I was in New Orleans and get everybody, all these artists on the album. It was almost like uh, once I started looking at it different, uh, things started opening up and I started seeing that glass half full versus half empty because I'm like, well, when is another time where all these amazing artists are home at the same time? So uh, I was able to get on everybody's schedule and we started to get these songs done. So Never Be The Same was up next. Um, this was one of the, the, the sessions that I had scheduled on the schedule before the pandemic happened. Um, but I knew I wanted it to be multiple voices. It's also a song I wrote for Dwayne Woods. Um, but I wanted um, my friend Tasha Cobbs, Brian Courtney Wilson, and Travis Green on this song. Uh, Tasha and I go way back. We went to college together. Uh, she was an amazing talent then. So people do not know, well some people know, but a lot of people do not know 
that there is a history between PJ and I. We actually went to college together uh, years and years and years ago. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to date us, but <laughs> we went to college together. And honestly, PJ, then and now, you are one of the most talented, most gifted um, musicians, singers, creatives of our generation and I've always honored and respected you for that. I think back over the years in college choir, we went on tour. I mean, this is my brother. Like for real, thank you for being a friend throughout the years and just to watch how you, you're walking out now, everything that you dreamed of and talked about back then. It is such an inspiration. It is such an encouragement to me and to be able to be a part of the gospel according to pj man this is incredible it's something that we've talked about for years and to see how you you have no boundaries there there's there are no there's no box for you and you've always been that way and so um to watch that now is man it's so dope you know i'm pushing you 100 percent always here you know we're friends. That's my dude, 100%. And I love you, man. And just to watch her grow and and flourish into the amazing artist and, and woman she is, uh, it's just been a delight to see that. Uh, so I reached out to Tasha, and of course she said yes. Uh, and she had, thankfully, recording at home. We were sending videos back and forth. Travis had his setup. Brian had his setup and those voices together. Uh, you would have thought they were in the same studio together, just the way they were bouncing off of each other and Never Be The Same is, is another one of my uh, favorite songs and they just took it to a different place. I think it became a different thing when those voices got on it. Uh, so In Love was a song that I originally did on Amber Bullock's debut album right after she won Sunday Best. And just, I picked this song because I wanted to have some rhythm on the album. This is this is different from every other song on the album. It's a reggae vibe. And uh, I knew I wanted to have that on it. Uh, it's, this song almost didn't happen the way it did with Z Zicardi Cortez and Daryl Walls on it. Uh, it was originally supposed to be the Walls group. And um, I remember when we were set to record, uh, some of them got sick and couldn't do the session, uh, but Daryl hit me and he was like, man, I can still go to the studio. I'm gonna go get it done. Uh, and uh, he went and cut all of it. All those backgrounds on that is, is Daryl. Uh, and, but when, when I started thinking about how special this album was becoming and how uh, the duets and the, the surprises or people you hadn't heard from in a long time, I was like, you know, Daryl is one of my favorite voices, but what could make this, what could make this even even more special? And um, I called Zicardi on the spot while Daryl was at the studio. And I was like, hey man, can you get to the studio like right now? And I think he was an hour away. And Zicardi got right in the car, went to the studio and cut, cut his stuff on the song. And here we have two of the, the greatest male voices I think of all time on the same song uh, on my album, Gospel According to PJ, something that happened last minute, which started just to confirm for me that this was meant to be. And, and all these hurdles were being made easier for me and happening the way they're supposed to because I was supposed to be doing this album. Don't Let Go is, is a special one for me as well. Um, I, I wrote it in a Maroon 5 sound check, where at least the music, I used to play that over and over uh, on the organ. And I wanted it to be a modern day hymn. And uh, I put it uh, on my Paul album uh, as a vocoder type thing. And, and when I put that album out, um, Kimberrell called me 
and um, she she was telling me how important the song was and how much it meant to her and and how it really touched her uh, and that meant a lot to me Kimberrell uh, I always tell people is is like the greatest singer in the world period um, it's, it's many people on record who, who confirm that for me uh, but for her to call me and take the time out to tell me how much a song meant um, coming from somebody who you look up to that way uh, it just it just it just meant a lot and that never left me so when I thought of this album and putting Don't Let Go on there, uh, she immediately was in my mind. And, uh, you know, I thought about it from a fan perspective. How do we like to hear Kimberrell? And that's what, it, with as little uh, in the way as possible, we just like to hear that voice. So I thought of it, I wrote it on organ, so I'ma play it on organ and I want, I want Kim to just, to just be able to talk and express herself uh, without a lot in the way, and man, uh, it was another virtual session. Uh, I was able to produce her from where I was, and we had a Zoom going, and we had the the audio going, and uh, it, it just, uh, man, one of one of my favorite voices, just one of the best voices out there. Uh, and, and I think communication, you know, is her gift to be able to get get a point across and get an emotion across. Uh, that's her gift. Here he comes again with the Clark sisters. Uh, the Clark sisters, uh, what can I say? I mean, they are, they, they changed the landscape of gospel music. Uh, like literally, uh, Twinkie and her production and her writing. For me as a little kid, with my dad being from Windsor and my family in Detroit, uh, they were superheroes to me. Uh, so uh, I, this was actually written in the Leandria sessions uh, that started this whole idea. But when I think about Leandria, I think about a direct connection to, to Dorinda Clark Cole. And um, so, so when I thought of this song and already had Leandria on the album, I knew that I wanted the Clarks to sing this. I knew I wanted Dorinda to lead this. And the way Karen is on that bridge, I mean, oh man, this, this was like, I, I, for much of this album, I was just like a little kid in a candy store, picking my favorite artists and, 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 and the artists who have influenced me uh, so much to actually be a part of this. And what was crazy is I've known a lot of these artists my whole life. They've seen me grow up. They've seen me uh, start in music. And this was just a full circle moment. And more than it being just huge artists on the album, it was family. This was family. This wasn't just me reaching out for features. So um, here he comes again. Uh, that bridge is, I think, my favorite bridge on the album. Uh, but just to have the Clark sisters on there uh, meant the world to me. Gotta Have You, a song that I originally wrote for Jonathan McReynolds. Um, I believe it became his first top 10 uh, radio song, but it just happened to originally be an uh, R&B record called I Just Wanna Love You. It used to be in my, in my MySpace, uh, on my MySpace list of music, I Just Wanna Love You. And I actually sold the song uh, to an artist named Maestro when I was working with Jermaine Dupri. Uh, and I remember uh, that album never came out. And I went to JD and I was like, JD, do you mind if I, if I take that song back? Because it was just one of my favorite little, little songs at that time. And he gave it back to me. I remember changing it to Gotta Have You. I was gonna uh, put it out uh, a different way. And uh, I, I was in LA and me and Warren and Jonathan were in the studio, studio together working on his album. And it was a totally different idea before. And uh, he was like, you got anything else? And I was like, well, I got this, this song, Gotta Have You. I was like, the, the, the verses are all R&B right now. But uh, so, so he loved it. And I remember he took it and he went back to his room and rewrote those verses and made it his. And um, the rest is history. Uh, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great song for him. Uh, and when I started to reimagine it for this album, I wanted to make it a little more live, a little more rootsy. Um, and uh, I wanted to add a, a little vibe to it. Kirk Franklin came 
at the in the ninth inning, the bottom of the ninth for me, uh, somebody who was originally supposed to be on the song couldn't do it. And I called Kirk and I was like, hey man, can you record this song? I just need it back in like three days. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine how busy Kirk is, uh, but he said he, he would try to get it done. And, um, and he did, he got it done for me. Kirk and I, we go way back. Uh, Kirk wanted to sign me. When I first came out, Kirk wanted to sign me as an artist. What a lot of people don't know is that I personally have had a chance to watch uh, his gift grow and blossom with a different lens. Um, early in PJ's career, I tried to sign PJ, 2005. I tried to sign PJ, I was starting a new label um, at the time and was just blown away by what PJ did. Uh, was, was like so many people, his voice, um, his approach to songwriting, his, his, uh, his skill set, just his timbre, his tone. Uh, his musicianship, it was like, you know, he's the full package. And who wouldn't want to have that, especially if you're going to be a brand new label. But I realized that his his dream was bigger than what any label could really offer him. Um, and we, we had sort of different visions. Uh, you know, he, he wanted me to be who I was, but he wanted just just to put a little gospel flavor on it. And I knew that I couldn't be in the middle. I had to define who I was from the very beginning or it would get very confusing. I was al already a preacher's kid. It was already a gray area. He came to the table with a lot of entrepreneurial um, aesthetic when it came to uh, what he needed, what he wanted, and um, his engagement of not just an artist but an owner. And so it was early on that I realized that, that this man was a uh, more than just a one-trick pony. He, he, he was going to be good not only uh, on the stage, but also in the boardroom. And so, uh, of course, he turned me down. And it was on the parking lot at a Phipps Plaza one night in Atlanta, Georgia. And I cried. And uh, I cried on his shoulder. He said, oh, don't cry, little one. It's going to be OK even though I'm not going to sign. No, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen like that. But I was really on that parking lot that, that night begging him like, yo, man, I want to be so connected to your gift because his gift is so dope. And, you know, he was he was still trying to figure out. He didn't know where he wanted to go. And, you know, he ended up uh, becoming probably one of the most successful independent artists in the urban space. But we never, we, we never uh, separated. We always remained cool and close. And um, he's he's always been there for me when I when I when I need advice or I need to talk to someone. It has been a great joy to see him be committed to a level of excellence, even though uh, the climate of music has changed. He has uh, he has remained authentic to his gift and to his calling, and his fans love him for that. They know what they're going to get when they get a P.J. Martin record or a freaking P.J. Martin show. Let me tell you something. If you have not been to a P.J. Martin live show, you dead. <laughs> You're not even living because you have not experienced life until you've seen that boy do what he does live. He's a freaking problem. He's a problem. He's a monster. He's a beast. And so I think that uh, we haven't even seen the best yet. Just like those times when he's always there for me, he was there for me for this and came through and man, it made it a different song. I mean, he just has the ability to lift. And then I wanted to add some color once he was on it. And I got Lena Bird Miles and my man Jermaine Dolly on it. And it became what it was and it's jamming. And uh, yeah, but that one almost didn't happen too. This is the, the, the theme of this album, all the, uh, collaborations that almost didn't happen but seemed like they became perfect for this album. That was another one of them. Over and over, I originally wrote for Trinity 5-7. Uh, it was actually uh, a big song. I remember something happening uh, in the business where out of my control, it wasn't able to be out there as long as I would have liked to. Uh, but it shot up fast and people knew that song and loved that song. But I think because it went away so quickly, I just felt like I wanted it to be a part of this. 
uh, to remind people of that song. And man, I called on uh, my True Heroes commission to do this song. And uh, I, I think I literally turned into a kid when, when, when we did a Zoom, for, you know, and talked about the song, seeing Keith there and Fred there and, 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 um, and Mitch, man, I, I mean, this was like, and Carl, this was like a dream come true. When I was about seven years old, a uh, commission came to my dad's church and uh, it was the first time I saw a real show. I mean, they brought in their amps. It seemed like a rock concert to me back then. I had never heard music that loud in my dad's church. And I remember waiting for them after the show was over by my dad's office to get their autographs because I was that, I mean, it was that life changing for me. And for it to come full circle and for them to be a part of this album, uh, man, it, it meant so much to me. I had, I, I had stayed connected with, with Fred Hammond, uh, even played in his band for a little while. Uh, but this was different, having commission together and the commission that I grew up on that really showed me, uh, you know, uh, being, having quality, uh, having a standard and really it, it being okay to try to be the best at it. Uh, they, they, they believed in that music and they could compete uh, with anybody in music at that time, which is why I think uh, they went on to uh, inspire so many groups like Joe to see and Boys to Men. All these groups that came after uh, Commission uh, were highly influenced by them. So just to have them on this album was crazy. Uh, but one of my favorite parts of being able to do this album is to produce each artist the way I wanted to hear them. The way I did Here He Comes Again is the way I like to hear the Clark Sisters. Uh, the way I did Gotta Have You is the vibe I like to hear Kirk on with a group. Uh, commission, I wanted to uh, freeze them in time in the 80s, in the early 80s, when I first heard them as a kid. Uh, so I used those sounds. Uh, I made sure we had the reverb on the guitars and the drums to make it feel like that commission that I fell in love with as a kid. And it came out exactly like that. And they have not lost a step. They sound just like they did when those records came out. And um, uh, pe people were really happy with that song. I think that was one of the bigger surprises was hearing Commission uh, on a new song, but them sounding like Commission that we, that we knew. Do You Believe uh, originally was on my Christmas album, uh, Christmas with PJ Morton. And um, for, for that album, for me, I knew that I wanted a gospel song on the Christmas album. So I included it there. But for me, it just felt like a seasonal album for this song and for Yolanda Adams. It just wasn't enough. I didn't want you to listen to this, uh, you know, a few times a year at one, at one point of the year, every year. I wanted this to be on my gospel project as well. So uh, it fit right in and I, I made it flow. Uh, Yolanda is somebody who uh, literally watched me grow up. This year's nominees have mastered this difficult and awesome task and have given us some memorable melodies. And the Stellar Songwriter of the Year Award goes to, I watched this kid grow up, P.J. Morton. She would come to my dad's church and sing uh, when I was very small and always supported me and my sister, always gave us great advice, always uh, showed us what was possible um, in, this, in, this, in this business and in music in general. And um, it was like, like I said, this was a family record. But me calling on Yolanda, uh, I call her T-Yo-Yo, you know what I'm saying? And I've called her that for my whole life. So for her to be a part of this was just, just a natural thing, just a organic thing. And uh, you know, although it, I wrote it as a Christmas song, it's just a song. Uh, it's just a song that we can all relate to and that relates to that story uh, of, of who we believe in, you know? Do you believe? So many people didn't believe uh, when Jesus was in that manger, you know? And uh, it, it's a message that deserves to be all year round. So I was done with the album, I was done with the songs. Um, 
done with the artist, but I still felt like something was missing. I didn't want this just to be an album uh, full of song, hit songs and, you know, with big artists uh, and not have any, any heart and soul to it. Uh, so I thought about, well, you know, what is gospel according to PJ? And it's impossible to talk about gospel according to me without my father. My father is really the reason why, why I fell in love with gospel music. It's why I was able to be um, introduced to it. It's where I heard it. Um, he was involved in it. It's where I fell in love with the artist side and the production side. Uh, so I just couldn't tell my story uh, and have people understand who I am without understanding him and the connection to me. So I decided to do a conversation with my dad uh, and this became my favorite part of the album. I cut, I cut up our conversation into three interludes on the album. And for me, it really tied everything together and made it all make sense. Uh, the origin of him, which introduces the origin of me and him going through Windsor and Detroit and, and, and Detroit being the Mecca at that time. So he'd take me to Detroit when the Winans were at the top and Commission and Clark Sisters and feeling that energy, um, it, it changed me forever. And then for him to then support me, uh, even having all of that and deciding not to go into gospel music, not to be a gospel artist um, and saying, Dad, listen, I, I think my mission and my purpose is just a little different. And for him to still accept that, accept, accept me as, as being different as his son, still supporting me, being behind me, and for him to get this full circle moment where I did bring this gospel album and present this. But I think more than that, um, the lesson is, uh, you know, normalizing that I don't have to be a different PJ to write my R&B albums or uh, to be in a, in a pop band. Uh, I don't have to be a different person to write uh, First Began or Say So. Uh, I don't have to be a different person to write that song and then turn around and write Let Go or over and over. I'm the same person um, and, and, and God is so big um, and over all of this world that I think when we limit him to one thing, uh, it does a disservice to him. And I just wanted to show people that it was possible. And um, I, I'm still the same PJ. Gospel according to PJ is, is just who I am in general. Um, and I, I'm just so glad that uh, I was able to uh, learn these lessons and go through this journey in life and career in my career to get to this point where I could also show who I am and my foundation and where I come from. Uh, so it's just been, it's been a pleasure, man, and, and, uh, and I, I'm enjoying the journey. So much more to come. Son, you are amazing, and that's why I know you're able, even with the crossover, with how you brought such great music to the world with what you do. Uh, even with secular music, uh, but even your gift, your gift with what God has given to you uh, spiritually. A lot of people don't know, and I'll say this in closing, I had a breakdown in 1998 that really got you down because this was your dad, this was the dad that you loved, and you was just a teenager when you wrote that song, I Resign to put it in God's hands. It's out of mind. So you've been doing it for years and years and years, and you have simply become the best. They used to call me, uh, they used to say, uh, Bishop Paul Morton, uh, and uh, is that your son? And now they say, are, are, aren't you a PJ's dad? It's just a whole new world. It's a whole oh, world. man. Well, you're still, you, you're still number one in my book, Dad. <laughs> love you, son. Uh, all right, love you, too. Let me see if I can get over here.